Hello, and thank you for the kind introduction and the invitation and the opportunity to be here with you. Um, I think uh, a lot of new friends, which I really enjoy. I have a wonderful couple of days here in the Mosul. Um, and I will discuss an exhibition that I realized earlier this year. I will only focus on this exhibition. I think it will, it gives me enough to talk about and uh, possibly, you know, points of relation with the exhibition that we're seeing here and with Noel's previous presentation. Um, so, fossil experience um, happened in a former water reservoir in Berlin Prenzlauer Berg, a neighborhood which is close to the city center in Berlin and was a former part of um, East Berlin. Um, and it addressed the number of the widely divergent and in part violent realities generated by the use of fossil fuels, bringing together artworks and stories about geographies affected by the speculation and resource extraction involved in energy production. This is basically a fact sheet, so the project consists of an exhibition including works by Ayo Akimande, Romila Akadiri, Kat Austin, Mike Van Dijkmine, and Rachel Valley, and poetry banners with poems by Roger Machina, Ivan Ikiriko, and Julia Schlicher-Kastorf. The public program consisted of performances and a series of four, four panel discussions, which uh, um, you know, led to a lineup like this. And um, yes, and it was commissioned by the Super Gallery, the Prater Gallery, uh, which you already mentioned, Oliver, and, and um, we had to first postpone the exhibition, then move to a different space because ongoing construction work uh, would not allow us to use the gallery space itself. And when I say we, I mean uh, myself as a curator of the exhibition and my uh, colleague and curatorial advisor, Sonia Mono. And um, at that point in time, we had already decided about a number of the works and noticed that questions of water came up in several contexts and conversations that we had. So our occupation with fossil energy and the countless um, extractive and destructive mechanisms related to it was sort of undermined or grounded by water as a recurring motive. And that's when we decided that it would be kind of suitable to move this exhibition into a former water reservoir. So what you see on the left here is the entrance of the water reservoir. You would walk in on ground level, but it, was under, it still is underneath a hill. So on top is also a park and you can walk on top of it. And on the right side is a uh, picture of our flyers and it shows the response of the graphic designers who developed this very minimal design uh, with a perfectly symmetrical drop to symbolize both water and oil, but also a tear, for me it's very much a tear, and a drop of blood if you want so. Um, in regions with high levels of energy consumption, including post-industrial urban centers such as Berlin, where the exhibition took place, um, fossil energy and petroleum-based products are ubiquitous. As um, large parts of electricity provision continue to be dependent on fossil infrastructure. At the same time, greenhouse gas emissions, toxic waste, and environmental damage arising from the production, transport, and burning of fossil fuels continue to be overlooked or are downplayed by powerful institutions, which meant, for example, that at the beginning of 2022, natural gas or rather uh, fossil gas. Um, could be labeled as sustainable by the European Commission despite its negative climate impact. The notion of fossil experience points on the one hand to the experience of acceleration made possible by the widespread availability of cheap energy, particularly in the second half of the 20th century. On the other hand, it refers to the traumas of extraction, exposure and displacement, which threaten to further escalate as climate change progresses. So the exhibition essentially was um, about geographies affected by the speculation and large-scale resource extraction involved in energy production and storage. Um, in places like Berlin, where energy is always available, um, but energy infrastructures are rather subtle, these realities are hardly present. And uh, we wanted to make we wanted to make these ties between production and consumption visible again. Um, however, we decided to center the notion of experience because it is 
exclusive and relatable. The emphasis of the notion of experience underscores the fact that fossil energy and petrochemical products do not only exist outside of us or elsewhere, but um, they are, um, where am I? Yeah, everybody has a fossil experience, you know, in one or the other way. They're very, you know, divergent, very different, but everyone has one. And in a global net of trade relations, um, resource extraction, production, and speculation, countless places, existences, and movements are connected to one another. So the image on the right, you can see the floor plan, I think it's um, well visible, and, and the architecture of the space, which is organized in four concentric circles and a center, where we didn't um, install the work as not to impose a hierarchy between center and periphery. So we only use the center for the Shibari suspension performance during the opening. Um, and the water reservoir has a total of 850 square meters, rounded brick walls, as you can see from the circles, obviously, a six meter high ceiling, a constant temperature of um, between 7 to 10 degrees Celsius and uh, 80 to 90 percent humidity, which is kind of extreme conditions for a regular art exhibition. Um, so it was very difficult to work in that space, but at the same time, and it can also become overwhelming quite quickly, but at the same time with this opportunity to create an, a really unusual and unsettling experience for the audience and myself as well. So this is what my colleague and I informally called the cold room of the exhibition. It shows uh, work by Munira Al-Khadini. Um, and so when you would enter the space, you know, on a spring day, you know, with birds singing outside, and you would enter into the space and um, immediately sort of like sends the cold, and it's sort of like swallowed by the darkness and the intense echo of this very particular, very particular space. Um, and Wonder 1, 2, and 3 um, is a work by Mihai Kahira. I've mentioned displaying natural cards that have been carved into the form of oil drill heads and placed in artificially decorated aquariums, which would sort of like strengthen this idea that we are in an underground or underwater space. And the Arabian um, or Persian Gulf pearl diving has, long, has a long tradition that has shaped the region's economy and played a central role in cultural life. Natural pearls were already extracted in the late Stone Age, and they have inspired countless legends and have been attributed with many different meanings by various cultural groups. They involve a large range of attributes, um, from attributes from purity, wisdom, and fertility to tears of sadness. So here's the tear again um, that also came up with the graphic design. Um, and well into the 1930s, more than 100,000 workers would travel to the Atlantic Sea, um, still talking about the Red and Persian Gulf. Um, and they would work during the season from April to September. And then with the discovery of oil, it meant that pearl diving was no longer economically significant from the mid 20th century on when in many, in many Gulf states the export of crude oil became a key source of income. And by aligning these two motives, and I'm going to the next, and here you see a close up of the, of the, um, of the natural pearl that uh, a carved in the shape of drill hat. Munira uh, Akadili connected these two different phases in the cultural and economic histories of the Gulf. Um, the image on the right is close up. No, the image on the, uh, wait, right, yeah. <laughs> so the image on the right then is, um, is a poetry banner uh, with a poem by Ivivari Akiriko, and um, it's called The Palm and the Fruit. Uh, Ivivari Akiriko was a Nigerian writer, and this poem was first published in a collection um, titled Oily Tears of the Delta, so here again, the tear comes up again. Um, and Ibibari Ikiriko's political poetry bears witness to the environmental devastation in the Niger Delta, um, moving to a different geography, um, where over decades of petroleum production, um, that is the you know, decades of petroleum production, and his poetry calls for concrete action to be taken to address the want of destruction and neglect of the region. Um, during the opening of the exhibition, Ayat Kimande, who you can see on the left, um, he um, uh, is also a Nigerian artist, um, but from a younger generation, and in Bari Kiriko, Olities of the Delta was published in 2000. And um, Ayat Kimande read Ikiriko's entire poetry collection in an act of endurance and resistance against the violence 
violence and ignorance of petroleum producing industries who act in concert with nation states. The second, uh, the second image is another poetry banner from Roger de Machina, which again points to another geography. Um, the Seychelles is um, a landscape at the German Polish Czech border that has been ravaged by open cast mining. Uh, but I'm, I'm just mentioning it, not, not going deeper into here. But continuing with the work by Ayahuacan Mandela was installed in the exhibition um, because he did not only perform at the opening, or let's say the opening at the performance was sort of like tied to that particular work in the exhibition. And um, this work is titled Aguni Cleanup. And here he attempts to clean a river course in Aguni land of the Niger Delta. The video documentation of Aguni Cleanup shows how, with his bare hands, Ayahuacan Mandela pushes water from one place to the other, adding clean water with a canister. Played in a loop, this activity seems to be both endless and futile. Royal that shell, um, which also came up briefly in your presentation, um, began extracting oil in the federal state of Bayalisa in the heart of the Niger Delta in 1956. And from this point onwards, multiple national and international mining uh, companies have been active in the region. More than half a century later, oil pollution due to defective infrastructure, neglect of risk management procedures, and a lack of crisis intervention remain a constant problem. Humans, as well as small and human ecosystems, are significantly affected by the resulting environmental degradation, as well as air pollution and acid rain from the burning of expired gases, like everything that you can imagine, right? Um, Ayo Mandi's work criticizes the lack of efforts on the part of the government, as well as of international and national companies, in stopping oil pollution and cleaning of the ecosystem. Leaks and infrastructure, which has, in part, already been shut down, often remain untreated for days, for weeks, allowing true oil to flow into water bodies, mangrove forests, and agricultural areas by decimating fish populations and destroying harvests. Yeah, so again, there's a full range, you know, and the cleanup has not happened yet, really. Um, and this is 66 years after Royal Dutch Shell started um, started to extract oil in the Niger Delta. And this is um, also being addressed, or the, the reference to this geography is also being made by Nimo Basset in the, in the video work, which is downstairs. He speaks for the um, Mother, um, House of Mother Earth Foundation. Yeah, so there's a, there's a connection to in, in, this, in this exhibition. Um, and this, and I'm showing this, you know, as an example of how the public program consisting of performances and discussions was woven together with poetry and the exhibition. Um, I'm probably not going to be able like, to show you all the images of the, of the installed works in the exhibition, but, you know, this is an example. Um, we picked up on some of these questions um, in a uh, in a panel discussion titled Entanglements of Social, um, Environmental and Climate Justice. And here we addressed environmental and climate justice on a conceptual level, like what it means for Europe and the African continent with regard to accessibility, uh, consumption, the unequal distribution of climate impacts, and how European colonialism continues to reverberate in the present. Um, and in addition, um, Rebecca Bini Kennedy Asanta from Mecca Collective looked into histories of black resistance on the continent again against corporate colonial exploitation and racial capitalism. Teresa Bobasino from Fossil Free Culture and L, it's a collective that does similar work than uh, BP or not BP and Liberate Hate in the UK. They do it in the Netherlands and Royal Dutch Shell um, used to be at least partially um, a Dutch company, uh, which has, you know, is one of the, one of the oil majors really, so one of the largest petroleum producing companies in the world and they have like they're responsible for so many bad things. Um, anyway, and they've been at, they've been campaigning for uh, against fossil fuels, philanthropy, and especially um, Shell as a sponsor of culture in the in the Netherlands. And um, this was especially interesting because um, because of this connection, because of Ayu Akimande speaking as an Nigerian artist from this particular about and from this particular geography, and then. Teresa Bobastino from Fossil Free Culture and Al um, respond to it because that was also you know, one 
but would show one possible point of solidarity between cultural workers and the global south and the global north. So now I want to ask how much time I have left because I didn't set my alarm. <laughs> so I don't know really if I could show you one more. Okay, I'm good in time. Oh, wonderful. Okay. So um, this is the work um, by Rachel Riley. And so we're moving on to another context again, another geography. Um, and, uh, and fractions of feature length, video installation, platforming frontline indigenous artists and cultural workers struggling against threats to more than 50% of the um, Northern Territory of Australia from shale gas fracking. So now we move on to a settler colony. Um, as the country becomes a leading exporter of planet warming fossil gas, globally pressure on this region has intensified, threatening part one Aboriginal land rights and homelands. As the camera connects incommensurable legal geographies, extractive industry, and labor histories to ongoing resistances and movement, defenders of culture and water. Oh, sorry, it, it's my, my, really Defenders of culture and water, born of stories of manufactured consent and indigenous legal theorist Irene Watson explains the limits of the Western international legal system for planetary survival and justice. Plans to develop the north of Australia have been resurrected at different moments since the 19th century, but abandoned just as quickly for being built on fantasies that related little to the actual behavior of monsoonal um, desert water systems. So here water again is a very important is a very important motive. With the lifting of a state moratorium in 2018, um, uh, Britain, US and British, US and home mining companies seek to roll out toxic drilling mix over vast underground flows. Talk about groundwater, which are key connecting fiber of culture, law and food for First Nations. The installation consists of a wide-angle split-screen documentary and a map, which is here in the front, uh, showing where fracking permits are requested and granted and so forth Australia. The map is not exactly up to date. Um, I must say, Infections um, premiered in 2019 and has been touring through the country as part of an ongoing campaign against fracking on indigenous land. But it's a very dynamic situation, obviously. I'm not sure how it has developed, especially since the war in Ukraine. Um, the gas prices have been under the roof, and that makes expensive procedures such as fracking financially affordable. Of course, not ecologically affordable. You can never afford that kind of technology and environmental fuck up. Um, so, this is just a um, still, so you can see the split screen. Uh, we had it in, um, translated into German, so we had two screens on the side actually that was a compromise um, and here uh, on the left you know that was not shown in the exhibition is an image of a uh, LNG terminal that is you know currently under construction in the north of Germany um, and um, where's my text for that slide Despite, you know, I, I already mentioned it before that despite its, you know, negative kind of balance, um, fossil gas like nuclear energy was defined as sustainable by, by the European Commission at the beginning of 2022, which is a straightforward lie. There's nothing sustainable about fossil gas that really isn't. Um, and um, it's, I'm not sure if it's even, even a greenwash, it's betrayal, it's straightforward. And of course, this classification promotes investments and the expansion of climate da damaging um, fossil energy projects. And in order to become less dependent on Russian gas supplies, Germany is now pushing ahead with the completion of import terminals in Wilhelmshaven, which is the here Wohnsbüttel and Stahl to expand the part the supply of energy in the midterm. Now the question is, what places in life worlds lie on the other side of the corporate fossil fuel supply chains? And the image on the Right, uh, shows, um, no, oh my god, I'm confusing the signs. So, what you see on the right is um, another poetry banner with a poem by Maria Spicher Kastor from Pennsylvania. And it um, sort of like tells the experience of, um, of hydraulic fracturing um, 
and test things for hydraulic fracturing in a community from the perspective of the community. And I was in a conversation with Yash, with Yash, which had cast off right after the war had started, and she was like, see, you know, I could see the trucks running down the highway with heavy gear and fracking water, and I can see the LNG tanks um, leaving leaving the port in Philadelphia. And this is this is the connection between the different life worlds. Whereas, you know, in, in, in Europe, in most parts of Europe, fracking is actually forbidden. Europe still profits from, you know, the willingness of other nation states to explore territory and endanger um, endanger more than human ecosystems. Um, yeah. So over the last of the past decade, what has commonly referred to as natural gas has come to be framed to be as a fuel to bridge the transition um, towards um, fossil free energy futures. And because gas produces around half as much CO2 emissions than coal and burn is framed as a cleaner alternative source of energy, which I already mentioned is not, and we decided to call it uh, fossil gas, or natural gas, because natural gas is a misnomer. It gives you this idea that it's like a fluffy green thing, which it's not. I'm repeating myself. Anyway, um, so um, it does not, when you say it's cleaner, it does not take into account its entire life cycle. Um, and uh, because in the production, the production releases methane into the atmosphere, which is a far more potent greenhouse gas than CO2. Methane emissions are caused by the deliberate venting or flaring as well as by leakage at all stages of production, storage, transport, and consumption. And they can find natural gas, LNG, and also especially energy intensive procedure, as the fossil fuel must be cooled down to minus 160 by, uh, degrees Celsius to reach its compressed and liquefied form. And then energy can be shipped over long distances without pipelines. The tank is used for transport and in turn powered by, by um, gas or fuel oil. And in this panel discussion, um, we talk with Argentinian anti fracking activist Esteban Servat, with Christopher Vasadu, which is, who's a member of the Carito Camacrudo tribe of Texas, who is seeing um, that you know, while in the north of Germany, import tunnels are being built on their territory, you know, sacred lands. Um, um, they see um, speculation about, or you know, state wants to wants to build export channels. Again, the connection between these nine worlds across across the Atlantic, across so many different oceans. Um, yeah, so I think I think what is written here, most of it I've said before because it was like so because I get so angry when I think and talk about fossil gas. But what I wanted to show basically is you know how some of these different strands, you know, discussions um, and and um, and performances and the exhibition were like put together. And like one last note for this one. Um, because I saw, I was so happy to see also the work of um, Gilbert Kill's Pretty Enemy the Third, because in that protest against the Dakota Access Pipeline, um, the the slogan was uh, was was uh, came up, "Water is life," and um, that has been repeated or it has been picked up by this struggle of First Nations in Australia against fracking on the territory. It also comes out in Rachel Violet's film because, you know, obviously is a strong is a strong theme. You know, fracking is, you know, not only using a lot of water, but also, you know, a, a great danger to underground water systems. And um, yeah, and so I, you know, just want to point out the connection it has with like also images and, and slogans tend to travel. And I, I think I'm just going to end on that note.